So yeah, I'm going to talk about something that's in the unlikely intersections world. Uh, and so of course that sort of manifests itself in different settings. Um, so, I, but I'm going to talk in the setting where we're working in a, a Shimura variety. Um, so I appreciate that, you know, that's not an object necessarily familiar to everyone, um, but let me give you some examples because I'm going to specialize to these later anyway. Um, so maybe the most famous uh, Shimura variety is AG, uh, which is the moduli space uh, of principally polarized uh, abelian varieties of dimension G. Uh, but even more simply than that, and this really is a setting that gives you a, a good sense of lots of what's going on in these problems, it's just a, a Cartesian product of the level one modular curve, so y1 to, to the n, um, which is a, as a, as a plane variety is simply affine n space, so sort of as simple as, as you can get. Um, <clears throat> anyway, so the point for me is that within a Shimura variety, um, there exists a, a collection of uh, distinguished subvarieties, sometimes known as uh, special subvarieties, which um, I suppose is really just not not a great name for uh, essentially the images uh, of Shimura varieties. Uh, in S under so-called Shimura morphisms. So obviously to unpack that, we'd have to get into the nitty gritty of Shimura theory, but let me just say a few words. So um, analytically, S is always the quotient X mod gamma for a Hermitian symmetric domain X and a, a congruent subgroup gamma of some underlying algebraic group. And the Shimura morphisms are the ones that arise by finding some sub Hermitian symmetric domain and taking the quotient of that by some congruent subgroup of some associated group and then looking at the induced morphism to X. Um, but to be concrete, if we were to say work in uh, Y1 squared, then maybe the most important uh, special subvarieties there are just the vanishing loci of the so-called modular polynomials, which parameterize elliptic curves that possess a cyclic isogeny of given degree, if that means something. Uh, and then maybe if we just look in AG, maybe the most important special subvarieties of the, are the ones of so-called Pell type. So they're the loci that parameterize abelian varieties uh, that have extra endomorphisms. And as I say, I'm gonna focus on those in a, in a moment. Um, so there's a very fruitful conjecture about the distribution of these uh, special subvarieties that's known as the Zilber pink conjecture. Um, although, it, you know, it should be pointed out that ideas and motives of, of these sorts of conjectures also appear in works of Bombieri, Massa, Zanier, and, and, and others. Um, <clears throat> oh, no, I just want to talk about one conjecture, not several. Um, and so this is the following. So you take a, a random subvariety, say, V, irreducible, uh, and, and defined over Q bar, because, so of course, you can, you can ask this question over, uh, over other fields, but Recent work of um, Barrero and uh, Dill essentially reduced the question to the one I'm I'm posing here. So we'll we'll, we'll stick with over Q bar, and then what you you have to do is you you intersect V with uh, the special subvarieties in S. that are of low dimension. So I'd like the co-dimension to exceed uh, the dimension, oh, sorry, this should be a V. 
I want the co-dimension to exceed the dimension of V. So another way to say that is the if you add the dimension of Z to the dimension of V, you get a number that's still uh, strictly less than the ambient dimension. So for any given Z, you don't expect uh, any intersection with V. Uh, but this union here is a is a countably infinite one, so maybe you get something, but the unlikely intersections paradigm says that it should be sparse. So uh, in, in, in an algebraic world, uh, that at least means uh, this should be not Zariski dense. Uh, in V, uh, but of course there's some degenerate situation uh, that you have to take care of. So unless uh, V is contained uh, in a proper special subrority. Which doesn't guarantee the risky density because in a Shamor variety, there's no guarantee that you have special subvarieties of the dimension you want. But if they're there, we now actually do even have some theorems that say, you know, you get lots of intersections, but um, that, that that's the talk for, for another day. Okay, so as I haven't said too much about what all these objects are, let me give you the, the most classical open case uh, of Zilber Pink. So in particular, what this says is that if I take a curve in A3, so irreducible again, and okay, let's say now not contained uh, in a special, in a proper special. Okay, so for instance, you know, I don't want um, some fixed modular polynomial to vanish uniformly on two coordinates of C across the whole of C, something like this. Um, and I let uh, sigma be the set of points on C, so let's call those points X, Y, Z, and C, where two modular polynomials vanish. So let's say phi M, X, Y equals phi N, Y, Z equals zero. Um, so for some, for any choice, M and N, then what Zilber Pink says is that this set should be finite. Oh, I guess I, yeah, this is rather stupid because I already said it's on C. So let's just say then then sigma is finite. And um, so, I mean, I think it's kind of quite striking, at least to me, that so we, we can't prove this conjecture yet, despite its uh, seeming simplicity. It is open in general. Uh, there is a very strong element of progress towards it. So this is a theorem due to uh, Habiger and Peeler, under the assumption that C is asymmetric. So what that says in this case is, so you can take the coordinate projections on A3 and restrict them to C, and uh, assuming you didn't take some special kind of curve, they this, these are finite morphisms, and you can look at the degrees, and it's asymmetric as long as they're not all the same. Um, so I think one might argue that this handles most curves, but of course, not, not all of them. Um, and one of the theorems I want to talk about today, which is joint work with Martin Orr, is another partial case, um, which is to say that this is a theorem if, when you look at the Zariski closure of C, in P1 cubed, you contain the point infinity, infinity, infinity. So uh, a slightly different, uh, not contained within nor containing the, the conditions of having a peeler, also not containing everything, but um, a, a different bit of progress on, on the previous conjecture. Um, I think one thing to point out that Zilber Pink implies possibly the better known um, Andre Ort conjecture. Um, 
which says that um, if V in S contains as a risky dense set of special points, Uh, then, then V is special. But that's now a theorem. Um, so due to, I think it's fair to say a lot of people, but the latest in, in, in the series was due to Pilar, Shankar, Simmerman, um, this paper has a nice appendix also by um, Eno uh, and Grushinek. Uh, but the list is, is long in that case. OK, so um, before I speak about large girl orbits, I want to dwell a little bit on the overall general strategy to prove Zilber Pink and similar things. So this is a, a rather beautiful strategy, usually known as the P. Lasagne strategy, uh, because it first appeared in a new proof of the Manin-Mumford conjecture. And it was exciting because it used ominimality in sort of, I think, one of the first instances in in diophantine geometry. So how does it work? So as, as I mentioned, S is analytically a quotient, x mod gamma. And so it has this uniformization map I from X. And although S is an algebraic variety and X has a very natural algebraic structure because it sits as a semi-algebraic subset of a projective variety, Pi is highly transcendent, or it doesn't, it's not obvious how to pass uh, algebraic information between the two sides of, of this picture. But what you can do, and I think this was first noticed by Petazil and Starchenko, is you can take a fundamental set in X, which is to say a, a, a nice connected domain that contains uh, finitely many points from each gamma orbit in X. And you can restrict the map pi to f. And it was noticed that this is definable in um, an O minimal structure uh, R and X. So what that means is that the map, or maybe let's say its graph, can be defined in the semi-algebraic real language, but where you allow yourself to also include symbols for restricted analytic functions and the real exponential. But in addition, what had been proved prior to that was that this the sets that arise in this structure are topologically tame. And that's what we mean by being O minimal. So that allows you to do lots of things. And one thing that uh, came out of this was a proof of a certain functional transcendence property of pi. Yeah, pi, as I say, is highly transcendental, but nonetheless, one can say something rather strong, which is that it satisfies a functional analog of, of, of Shamwell's conjecture. So this is called Axe Shamwell, which is in itself something like an unlikely intersection statement for the graph of pi. Um, and this is proved now by Mock Peeler Zimmerman. And in fact, this is now available in even greater generality than the one I'm talking about. Um, and I should say that, as I said, as I mentioned before, proved in part by O minimality, uh, although there are other techniques now that allow you to prove it. Um, but what it does for you in, in in the Zilber pink picture is it is it essentially finishes the geometric side of the Zilber pink conjecture, um, which is a little bit vague, but let me just, let me summarize by saying that if you have this, 
then you can show that it now just suffices to consider uh, unlikely intersections uh, of dimension zero. So you're looking at, of course, intersection Z intersect V, and you can restrict your attention to where the components of that intersection are simply points. Uh, and that was that was sort of one of the main points of a paper I wrote with um, Jimbo Ren. Okay, let me try to say just a few words about special subvarieties. So how these come about is you're looking for, as I say, Hermitian symmetric subdomains of X. Um, so what those look like, they're homogeneous spaces. So that means there's some orbit of a reductive group H, or I should say the connected components of the real points. But you, you're not free to just choose any X and H. Um, you want to impose something to the effect of uh, H is the so-called Mumford take group uh, of the point X. Uh, but for such an object, you push this down to S and this gives you um, a special sub-variety. So some properties, these are defined over Q bar. So in particular, so is S, which I suppose was implicit in my formulation of um, the Zilberpin conjecture at the beginning. Um, they're also stable under intersection. So what I mean by that is if you intersect two, you get a finite union of others. And so what that tells you is in particular, if I take a point P on S, then there's some special subvariety um, brackets S, the special closure of S, which is the smallest special subvariety containing S. And they're also they're also stable under Gawa. which I think in full generality is actually a theorem due to Martin. <clears throat> so we're gonna do a kind of counting um, proof uh, or at least strategy with special subvarieties. And so in order to do that, um, one always seems to need to attach to a special subvariety, uh, a notion of complexity. So some natural number, uh, that allows you to count, uh, let's say I want to count other aspects of a special sobriety and I want to, I use this as an intermediary and I always count it with respect to, to this complexity. So this should be natural in some sense. So if, if I'm looking at the vanishing locus of a modular polynomial, then it seems to me I have really little choice but to choose um, delta equals n. n is the associated... Uh, number with the modular polynomial. Whereas if I was looking at something of Pell type, then this is a subvariety parameterizing abelian varieties with endomorphisms containing some given endomorphism algebra. And so there I'm inclined to take something like the discriminant um, of the endomorphism algebra of that, of that generic abelian variety on the special subvariety. So one doesn't necessarily need this, but I'm also going to say that this should be uh, stable under Galois as well. So if I conjugate the special subvariety, then I, I would like uh, I would like the complexity to stay the same. Okay, so. I now want to try and handle uh, the zero dimensional part of the Zilberpin conjecture. So I want to uh, somehow be able to control 
uh, zero dimensional unlikely intersections on my V. And this is again where uh, O minimality seems to be a good tool. So to get going, I want to construct a sort of an intersection variety. And rather than an algebraic variety, I want it to be some kind of definable set um, for my unlikely intersection points. So I'm talking about a set that should look something like pairs y comma z, where y should belong to some space capital Y, which I'll say more about in a moment, but this should be somehow parameterizing special subvarieties, whereas Z should lie not actually on V, but on the pre-image of V in the fundamental domain. So we're going to work upstairs. And then I impose some connection between these two uh, Y and Zs by saying that Z should lie on XY. So let me explain what I mean by that. So what is this Y? It should be some, some kind of parameter space belonging to some Rn um, that parameterizes subvarieties of X. And because I want these to sort of vary in a, in a, in a real continuous sense, I'll look at say all totally geodesic subvarieties of X, of which special subvarieties are a particular kind. But I want some arithmetic control. So what I what I might ask for is that if Y happens to be rational, then the X Y associated is special. And the naive height of this Y so, I mean, in this case, of course, Y is just A over B in lowest terms. So I take the maximum of their absolute values. I'd like that to be controlled by some positive power of the complexity of the XY. So just doing this part is, is an, open, an open problem, really, in general. One has to deal with this in all manner of settings. It's kind of the other thing that Martin and I spend our time doing. Um, and I'll say more about that in, uh, in, uh, in a moment. Um, so why is this constructible set useful? So the point is that now I'm gonna look at say some unlikely intersection on V of zero dimension. And from it, I should generate a a pair, ys, zs, that sits on D, but by the parameterization requirement that I wrote above, it shouldn't just be a point on D, it should be what we call a, a semi-rational point, even of controlled height. So it's gonna look like D subscript delta S, delta S is shorthand for the complexity of the special closure of S. And this should be, um, okay, let me, I'm not going to get it in there, so let me go down here. This should be the set of points y, z on D, where y is rational, and the height of y is at most a power of the complexity. So, as I say, we call these semi-rational points because y is rational, and in fact, controlled height, whereas Z, we, you know, is, we have no control on the arithmetic. But uh, the reason why being definable is so powerful is because there are, there are theorems, several different versions, due to Peter Wilkie, that allow you to count how many such semi-rational points of bounded height uh, you have. And in this case, they, they tell you that the number of points on D for any T is T to the epsilon for any positive epsilon. Now I should say this is true unless uh, there happens to be um, a definable path into D that's semi-algebraic in the Y coordinate
But um, again, using results from functional transcendence, this can be ruled out. So when, when V is a curve, um, this was another result in the paper with Jimbo. And more recently for arbitrary V, um, this, this part of the strategy has been, has been established by a, a student of Jonathan Peeler, namely uh, Olivio Cassani. So uh, the point is that if I take a, a zero dimensional unlikely intersection, I get a semi-rational point in this definable set. And I know that it also has some controlled height. And I know also that the number of said points is quite tightly controlled by Peter Wilkie. So that the idea then is to play that off against something that says there's lots of such points. And that's where the large Gal orbits conjecture comes in. So I think this was kind of in this modern form formulated by Abigail Pila in the first instance, although of course it relates to many things in, in number theory when, when correctly formulated. Um, let, me, let me say it in the following way. So let S be um, on V a zero dimensional unlikely intersection. Then one hopes that the size of its Gao orbit, so which is a collection of uh, other unlikely intersections on V, is at least some positive power of the associated complexity. So this is some, I suppose delta should come at the start of the statement rather than the end, but some uniform power of the complexity. Uh, we have some lower bound on, on the size of the Gao orbit. Um, so let me, I won't write down these, let me just make a couple of remarks. So um, when S is actually a special point, um, this is implied by this final piece of the puzzle proved by Pila Shankar Simmerman, which obtained Andre Orr. The, the only difference there is, of course, uh, for Gao orbits of special points, you don't need this unlikely uh, assumption, you you have a uniform bound across all special points on the Shimura variety. Um, but of course, nonetheless, it, it implies what, what I'm stating here. Um, the only other cases I'm immediately aware of is then the cases that take place in um, Y1 to the N. And again, as I mentioned at the beginning, these are available either in the asymmetric case proof by Habi Kapila, or in the case I'm about to explain where you have, you contain uh, the point infinity, 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 infinity at the boundary. Um, the one slightly interesting thing is that in the Habi Kapila case, that their, their proof works when n equals two. Um, and of course in n equals two, you, the intersections are again, not unlikely, they're just likely. There are two curves intersecting in two space. So it's really not clear. I mean, of course one needs unlike, one needs the dimensions to, to imply unlikeliness for zero pink, but it's really not clear where in the arithmetic they become they become relevant. Anyway, so let me now um, speak just about AG. Um, so the first thing to point out is that um, results of mass of Wustoltz, in all the cases I have thought about tell you that this complexity that you're dealing with is always bounded by the maximum of the V height of the point S and the size of the Gao orbit to some power. And so what that means is for our purposes, if we want this lower bound on Gao orbits, um, it's just as good to try and bound this V height in terms of the Gao orbit. 
And in fact, you can be a little softer than that. You could have some arbitrarily small power um, of the complexity itself, um, which actually will, will appear. <clears throat> so this becomes, this height bound becomes the sort of a, a reincarnation of, of, of the Gal orbits conjecture itself. Um, and so the, what, what has taken our attention for several years now is quite an old method, um, which appears in Andre's book from 1989, G functions and geometry, which is based in the, the theory of G functions. Um, <clears throat> so let me try to just explain how this works. So from now on, I, I restrict purely to curves because I, I, I can't say anything beyond curves right now. So let V be a curve in AG. Um, and actually it turns out to be better to, rather than think about a sub variety of AG, but to think of a, an abelian scheme um, over a curve, which I'll call C. And I'll I use a different letter in part because I might modify this slightly. So this might, this will be smooth. And <clears throat> I might've replaced it with a cover and so on. So this should be an abelian scheme. Uh, of relative dimension G um, over uh, K, a number field. So what you can do is attach two gadgets to this setup. So you can look at the, um, the relative Duram cohomology in degree one. And dually, you can look at the homology local system. So R1, Fn lower star. I saw the, I, I can see a question, but I can't. I'll, I'll take care of it. Cool. Don't worry. Thanks. Um, so you have these two gadgets. And um, so I'd like to trivialize these. So, so, uh, WDR is locally free. So if I shrink C a little bit, I can assume that this is uh, just a power of the structure sheaf. And so W is an analytic thing. So I, but if I take some small enough set in C an, the analytification, then I can assume that W restricted to U is, is constant. And so having trivialized these, I can choose a, a basis. So W omega i, let's say for Duran. And uh, <clears throat> let's say gamma j for homology. So basis or frame, whatever the, is the right word. And um, so then I can, in a very natural way, I just pair these. Uh, to get a function or set of functions on u, an analytic function to c defined by u goes to uh, the integral of omega mm -hmm. r u to gamma j u. And sort of to make the, make everything work, I actually divide by one over two pi i, which kind of ruins the, the name I'm about to use, but let's call these period functions. And then it's very classical um, from the theory of Picard Fuchs equations or the Gauss Manning connection on the Duram cohomology that if you take uh, the Taylor series of, um, sorry, not of, let's take the Taylor series of these functions um, at some point, S0 on U then um, these functions or these Taylor series satisfy uh, a linear homogeneous differential equation. Uh, over the polynomial ring. And as I say, that's all uh, very classical, but the observation I think of Andre was that now we just changed the setup slightly. So we push this point S0 to a point in the compactification of C. 
and assume that that's a point of multiplicative degeneration of the family. So, okay, so now I assume that A extends over C bar, and I assume that AS0 is just the split torus, GM to the G. Then half of these FIJs can be made to extend. So let's suppose these ones over, um, uh, my notes I've written C bar, maybe let, let me call it U bar, um, being a bit sketchy there. They can extend over the, uh, the, the missing point, S0. Um, but moreover, they belong to this arithmetic k double brackets x. So they have algebraic coefficients. And the, the height of the coefficients is, is quite well controlled. So the height, the naive height of the nth coordinate uh, grows like d to the n for some positive D fixed. So that's a list of nice properties that the FIJs have and such functions were considered a long time ago by Siegel and, and he called those G functions. And so why is that relevant? Well, the point is that these G functions have what's called um, a so-called Hasse principle. So let's call this the Hasse principle for G functions, which I think is due to Bombieri, unless there's something predating this. What that says is, so now just generally, let's assume that you have some family of G functions. So some finite collection of power series over some number field, satisfy uh, the properties I mentioned before. Um, and you're looking for global relations between these G functions. So what I mean by that is you're looking for polynomial relations that hold between the values of the G functions at a point. But to make sense of that, these are power series. So one has to have a notion of convergence. So you're asking for a, a relation that holds in any completion of the number field K, whenever all of the G functions converge in that, num in that completion. So let me, let me try to write it down. So a global relation. Uh, on curly F at say X in K is a homogeneous polynomial Q over K such that for all V in the places of K, if FIX converges in KV, for all i, then q f one x f n x is zero in k v. Okay, so when for all the places where it might where it makes sense to ask if the polynomial vanishes, it has to vanish. <clears throat> and we want we're going to talk only about non-trivial relations, which are relations that are not the specialization of a relation between the G functions over the polynomial ring K big X. <clears throat> So I, I apologize, I've lost some of the slides. Thankfully you're recording it. Um, I, I expect you wouldn't have had time to read what I just wrote, but anyway, 
setting aside the definition of global non-trivial relations for one moment, what, what the Hasse principle for G function says is that if you look at the set BD, so the set of algebraic numbers such that F, curly F satisfies Uh, a global non-trivial relation of degree D at X, then the logarithmic height of this set is growing only like D to some positive power mu, or every point on that set has height constrained by D to some positive power. So Andre was after exactly the same bounds that we were after and proved, and proved such bounds. So using this idea, uh, Andre proves the following. So in his case, he, he assumes, suppose your abelian scheme is generically simple. Uh, G is bigger than one and odd. Then he shows that for all S on base, such that the endomorphism ring of the associated B and variety does not embed into MGQ. So that's one way of saying that the endomorphism ring of the associated fiber is large. Uh, then these points have height growing no faster than the Galois orbit to some positive power mu, which is, which is exactly the kind of bound that we want for, for large Gower orbits. So let me say a few words about this. So the proof, um, well, let me say it in one line. So when you have extra endomorphisms, these produce relations between periods. So that's the idea. The main limitation, if I can use that word, is that this assumption on the endomorphism ring, I would say is mainly here because what that's saying is that I can't be, for, for a finite place V, I can't be V adically close to S zero because if I am sufficiently close, then my reduction is the same as the the fiber S0, which we assumed is GM to the G. So if that happens, then the endomorphism ring of my abelian variety, which embeds into the endomorphism ring of the reduction, which is MGQ, which contradicts the very assumption that I made in the theorem. So this says that V um, S is not viadically close to S0, which is the same thing as saying that um, Okay, when we pass through, a, say, a local parameter, V is not viadically small, and uh, S is not viadically small, and so these places become irrelevant when I'm talking about global relations. It's not necessary to construct relations at finite places. <clears throat> so finite places become irrelevant. And that's a huge help, because when you want to go and construct relations, you're only left with finitely many, namely the Archimedean ones. You can construct your relation at each place. You multiply these all together. And as long as that each given relation is of constrained degree, the product is no larger than the size of this. And, and so you can apply Bombieri successfully. Um, <clears throat> let me just mention that um, the case of y1 to the n is, of course, ruled out here as well, because when you're dealing with y1 to the n, you're looking at relations for modular polynomials, which is saying that two coordinates are isogenous to the square of an elliptic curve, and, and, and that precisely has an endomorphism algebra m2q, so it's sort of precisely the case that we're not in here. So y1 to the n is impossible here.
and, and one final thing is that, and Andre makes this remark that because G is greater than one, at least as as it stands, you can't hope to prove something like uh, add. I'm not sure if I said this, so I, this is I, I maybe I missed this point. The mu that comes from Bombieri is effective, which is rather which is very nice. But because G is greater than one, you can't possibly hope at least in its current form, to prove something like an, an effective Siegel-Brower theorem, which of course would be fantastic. Um, and I should, so I should mention this effectivity is, was noticed um, by Binyamini and Massa, who at the same time as I think that we were noticing these results, um, proved uh, an effective version of Andre Ort um, for, Hilbert modular surfaces. So, <clears throat> okay, so I'm close to the end. So I, I think um, I'd just like to now formulate what we can do by pushing these ideas further. So the first result, uh, the first chronologically result is the one for y1 to the n. So what this says is that if you take n greater than or equal to three, and you take C in Y1 to the N irreducible over Q bar. Uh, again, not contained. In a proper special sub variety. And such that if you look at its Sariski closure in P1 to the N, then it contains, as I mentioned, the point infinity, uh, infinity, infinity. Then there exists a positive mu, effective, such that if S is a point on your curve, uh, that satisfies two modular polynomials, so let's say satisfies phi m si1 si2 equals phi n si3 si4 equals zero uh, for some m and n and two distinct pairs of distinct coordinates i1 i2 i3 i4 then um the height of this point is um well so it's bounded by uh the size of the gau orbit to the mu but we also in this early version have a, a small power of the m as well which is okay as i mentioned but i i mean i we haven't checked this but i presume that this uh, will disappears as i'm about to allude to in a minute um but in particular so this proves Zilber pink uh, for this C. And as I say, what's new here is that one really has to deal with arbitrarily many finite places. Um, so let me just state what, what we can do then in the more general case. So now uh, take a G greater than or equal to two, and let's C be a curve in AG defined over Q bar. So again, irreducible, um, not contained in proper special. And now we have to make the right assumption. So we can take, there's a risky closure now in the so-called bailey borel compactification of AG, which uh, of course is slightly technical, but what's nice about this is it has a nice stratification. Looks like this. And we want that C bar hits the sort of furthest uh, point at infinity, namely this A0. And then we get the same sort of thing. So then there exists uh, Okay, so then in, in some sense effective, I want to say more about that, that if um, S in Q bar 
belongs to any um, Pell type special subvariety uh, of co-dimension greater than two, which I mean is almost all of them, of course. Uh, then the height of S is growing like the Gauss orbit uh, to some to this mu. So that implies zilber pink for those s on this c, such that uh, the endomorphism algebra of a s is either a totally real field um, of course not not equal to q or uh, a non-split, um, totally indefinite uh, quaternion algebra um, over a totally real field. And the reason there's this additional restriction here is because of the parameterization problem. So as I mentioned, this is kind of partial, um, but as I as I understand it, um, a student of Martin's, uh, B.J. Batter, I think is very much close to establishing at least all of the other uh, simple Pell types, which would then lead to Zilber Pink for all of those. So let me just say, finally, um, so how, what's the proof for these results? Well, in the Y1, the N case, this is take uniformizations. And in AG, it's the natural generalization. So rigid and formal uniformizations as in uh, the works of um, Mumford and Braino and Fulting's Chai. And I just want to sort of make one final remark. So a sort of CF. Um, there are also works along these lines using G functions and so on in the works of uh, Papas, George Papas and David O'Bannon. So those are worth checking out as well. Uh, but I think I've definitely run out of time. So. Thank you very much.